Hi, friends and partners, employer branding experts and experienced professionals. Welcome to Oddwork Employer Branding Talks. My name is Charles Sinclair. I'm head of employer branding here at Oddwork. And together with my friend, partner and CEO, Poyan Kirimi, we are delighted to welcome you back to the second edition of this live streamed event. Please, guys, feel free to just say hi in the comment section so we know that you're here, where you're from, and what your expectations are for this employer branding talk. Because twice a year, we do the Employer Branding Summit, an invitational event that gathers some of the most forward-thinking and progressive employer branding experts in the world digitally. And from that very format, the employer branding talks have evolved. Our guests at the summit asked us for a deep dive and open for all format where we depict one employer branding subject at the time in between the two summits. And that is exactly what we are going to do here today. And for those of you who were with us last time in February, we jumped into the most emerging employer branding trends for 2021. That time it was me and Poyan guiding you through five, 45 minutes of in-depth insight from both the candidate market and our most proactive employer branding partners. Today, however, we have brought an expert to join us, haven't we, Poyan? Indeed, we have. And it is not just any guest, any expert today. We are delighted to welcome Nicholas Gustafsson, partner and top worldwide master trainer at Dale Carnegie. And let me just stop right there for a second, Charlie. Top worldwide master trainer. That's not a bad title, is it? It's not a bad title at all. Uh, it's, uh, we, have, we have to ask him how we got that title. <laughs> uh, I'll note that as the very first question for, for Nicholas when he arrives. We will welcome Nicholas in, in just a minute, but before doing so, we would like to set some context about today's talk because company culture is nothing new, but questions regarding company culture are rising on the strategic agendas of, of companies and the disruption of last year has not slowed that process down, rather the opposite. Uh, employer brand, and company culture is more important than ever. And remote cultures, as discussed and mentioned at the last employer branding talk, were to be found on basically every company's agenda last year, as well as this year. And it forces us to discuss culture as something that is indeed not in the walls of, a, of the office, but in the people that together make up the company. Indeed, culture is important, but is any given strong culture good? What if the culture is wrong? What if it leads us in the wrong direction? What if the world around, around us change? Let's break it down together with an expert. Please, guys, welcome everyone. Please feel free to comment, share your own perspectives in the comment section as well. We see your guys' live comments uh, popping up on our, uh, our screens as well, and we will uh, bring that, uh, them into the discussion as well. Wonderful to see people from all over the world joining in as well in the comment section right now. Dale Carnegie, guys, is one of the world's most respected and well-known personal and organizational development companies, founded by the legendary Dale Carnegie himself in New York City back in 1912. Ever since, their trainers have developed individuals, organizations, and thereby cultures to become the best that they can be for any given time. The famous investor Warren Buffett says it best. In his office, you will not see the degree that he got from the University of Nebraska. You will not see the master degree that he got from Columbia University. However, you will find on that very wall the award certificate that he got from his Dale Carnegie course. Nicholas Gustafsson is a partner and a top worldwide master trainer at Dale Carnegie. He has won the Top Trainer Quality Award in the Europe, Middle East, Africa region, and he knows that what took you here won't take you there. It is our pleasure and our honor to welcome him to the Old Work Employer Branding Talks. Welcome, Niklas Gustafsson. Thank you. C can you say it one more time? Just a tiny <laughs> one more time. <laughs> yeah. no, no, let me just address the elephant in the room right away. Uh, what does it take to become the top worldwide master trainer? So, so Poyan, are, are you asking for a friend or, or for yourself? No, no, I have this. Uh, I have uh, this blonde friend in Gothenburg, Sweden. He's very interesting. <laughs> long hair, curly. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I understand. Okay. Well, it, jokes aside, what what it basically means is that in, uh, not only am I investing my time in, in clients and customers, but I also invest time and energy in training development. Uh, so it's kind of an interest of mine, and I love to contribute in that way in the Swedish Dale Carnegie or, uh, organization. And uh, basically, it means that I can recertify existing trainers, and I also help to provide new trainers to the Dale Carnegie Network. We are 3,000 trainers all over the world, 
And since my uh, my own certification one year ago to become a master trainer, uh, I can't say that I've been buried in work, you know, working globally. <laughs> so so I, I, I don't even know what it means or what it takes, but I'm glad to be here. We are super excited to have you here. You are indeed one of the most forward thinking personal and organizational development experts out there that we've had the favor to come across. Uh, we would love Thank for you. you to give our guests concrete examples of what they can do from today on to develop their people, their organizations, and thereby their cultures. But I would like to start with a bit more holistic approach. Yeah. What took you here won't take you there. We know that you have some examples of that from other contexts than necessarily company culture. Could mm -hmm. you give us an uh, example? Yeah, well, of course, the the, the, the first uh, thing that comes to mind is, uh, of course, uh, Dick Fosbury. Um, Dick Fosbury, he was a professional uh, athlete and, and high jumper. And, and given that uh, the landing surfaces had previously been sand pits or low piles of matting, uh, high jumpers earlier um, uh, years had to, to land on their feet or at, at least carefully to, to prevent injuries and stuff like that. So with the advent of, of deep foam matting, uh, high jumpers were able to be more adventurous with their uh, techniques, more uh, experimental with, with new techniques. So in the beginning of the 1960s, Dick Fosbury tried something completely new and he jumped with his back towards the bar and he flopped the bar. Yeah. So in the coming years, uh, more and more jumpers followed his example. And if you look closer to the progression of world records in men's uh, high jump, you can see a dramatic development around the middle of the 1960s. The sport took a giant leap and a uh, one big reason for that is that someone, somehow, somewhere, decided to do things completely differently. In this case, it was Dick Fosbury. He was first. Uh, and today, as a result of uh, the events of last year, uh, I see many organizations and industries making big changes in the speed of light. So maybe in, you know, in the same way that Dick Fosbury used the advent of deep foam matting to disrupt um, the jumping styles of high jump, we will see organizations uh, all over the world disrupt their industry by seeing the opportunities brought to us by an accelerated digital transformation. That is, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for great examples, setting a great context. And the sand pit has changed to something else. Let's uh, yeah. discuss th that also, great example. And we will get even deeper and try to translate that example um, into company culture context in, in just a minute. But before diving even deeper, uh, Nicholas, Charlie, I would like to ask you, the data on the relationship between organizational culture and, uh, and performance, Yeah. what do we have? What do we have? Yeah, so so it's it's a really interesting example, then, Nicholas, because um, we, when you look at uh, the correlation between corporate culture, company culture, and, and long term performance, um, you have two uh, really prominent um, Harvard Business School researchers, uh, John Cotter and James Heskett, that did a major study on this uh, already back in 1992. And the result is actually the the book Corporate Culture and Performance. For anyone who's interested, it's a really good read. Uh, and what they saw in uh, contradiction to general belief is that any strong culture doesn't cut it. Just having a strong company culture is not correlated to long-term performance. It's not that simple. And that is, um, as they explain it in connection to uh, the um, uh, issue of the drummer um, at many times leaders uh, that lead organizations in the wrong direction. Uh, and, and we do have a couple of examples uh, of this for, for everyone who's here today. Um, uh, Blockbuster, really well-known uh, major company back in a day that had over 9,000 video rental stores throughout the US. Today, they have only uh, one. Uh, they didn't manage to adapt to video streaming. Uh, if you look at other examples, you have Nokia, uh, that, you know, strong culture there as well, but they didn't manage to adapt from flip phones to smartphones. Another really well-known example is Kodak. Uh, major uh, photo company uh, didn't manage to adapt from um, from physical photos to digital uh, photos um, within the financial sector. Lehman Brothers, founded in in the 1850s, had a really high-minded culture focusing on client relations uh, and not profit and growth. Uh, we all know how that went. And um, an even more interesting example is 
uh, Uber uh, that many of us uh, come in connection with. And, and the New York Times put out a piece a while back, um, and the headline was Inside Uber's Aggressive, Unrestrained Workplace Culture, where they depicted the, the toxic culture that had occurred there. And what's interesting about that is not just that 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 they acknowledge that, but how um, Uber themselves acknowledge this toxic culture as a real threat uh, to their financial performance. So when they were going to the stock market in their IPO, they actually, and I, I brought the quote up, they said themselves, our workplace culture and forward-leaning approach created significant operational and cultural challenges that have in the past harmed and may in the future continue to harm our business results and financial condition. A failure to, a failure to rehabilitate our brand and reputation will cause our business to uh, suffer. So um, any strong culture doesn't cut it. it it's, not, it's not that simple. Interesting example. So, so any strong culture doesn't cut it. We, we're taking a look at some, some famous examples, great examples, uh, leads to the question. So what does it take? Yeah, exactly. So, so what, what they found um, is that um, when you look at um, successful organizations long term, uh, you have cultures that can help the organization to anticipate and actively adapt to environmental change to reach uh, the company's strategic goals. So these are cultures that constantly evolve with new market conditions, just as you mentioned there prior, uh, Nicholas. So it's these adaptive cultures uh, that are connected um, with superior performance over time. And so this is the theory today that is representative of all long-term po top, performance, uh, top performance. And at many times, these are cultures that focus to a very great degree on the customer experience, uh, that the customer's changing needs uh, is a way to pull the organization forward. So th the question really that, that they say is the most relevant one is not just do we have a strong culture, but do we have the right company culture to reach our strategic uh, goals? Okay, that's a really interesting question and also a very hands-on question for our guests today to, to take with them and ask for themselves in, in their very uh, organizations. Uh, so it's not just about having a strong com uh, company culture, it's about having the right culture in regards to the strategic goals. Yeah. Do we have an example of, of uh, that take perfectly executed or well executed? I mean, th there are many interesting examples here, but but, but we just uh, we can just mention one, uh, as as many uh, people who are with us here today probably know of the company, and that is Netflix. Um, so what's really interesting about um, Netflix is um, how they have a really well known uh, adaptive culture uh, to the degree that. Uh, this book, No Rules Rules, just came out depicting uh, Netflix company culture. It's a really good read for those who, who are interested. Um, and uh, when you look at Netflix's culture, Sheryl Sandberg, who's the CEO at Facebook, she's actually said that the Netflix culture deck that explains Netflix culture may, quote, well be the most important document ever come out of Silicon Valley. Um, and what's so interesting about the Netflix culture is how they have manage to successfully um, um, adapt to four major industry transitions in just the last 15 years. Um, so if you look at Netflix, uh, based on who they are and the market that they are in, uh, first major transition uh, was the switch going from rental DVDs to streaming old content, uh, films and uh, TV series. Uh, the second one was uh, streaming old content to launching new content with uh, external studios such as House of Cards, etc., major change as well. Um, third one being uh, how you uh, worked with licensing external studio content to building in-house studio content and creating uh, Netflix original um, content like Stranger Things and Mindhunter, etc. And and finally, of course, a major transition going from a USA only company to a global company in 190 uh, countries. So when you look at this adaptive culture of Netflix that has obviously very successfully as an entertainment company managed to uh, navigate through these major transitions, uh, you see a couple of, of really interesting things. And uh, one of them is that they uh, make sure to have this adaptive, adaptive mindset, uh, getting the right people on the bus, as they say, and also actually getting the wrong people off the bus and also having leaders that, that drive change. Um, so that's just one example that we're on. That, that's really interesting. So, so we're talking about uh, strategic goals, setting the agenda for the culture. So the right culture is the one that actually helps the strategic goals to be fulfilled. And, and then we talk about adaptive cultures executed. And Nicholas, I just want to uh, bring you in here. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, when thank you're you for doing that because I'm, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here, you know, let, let me in. Uh, I, Jump into the conversation. <laughs> I'm jumping in. Here I come. 
Watch out. I absolutely agree. I think that we need, uh, I, I agree about the importance of connecting the company culture to the strategic destination or the goal. Uh, and this basically means that the culture, what we say here is that the culture needs to change. If the destination, if the destination change, the culture needs to change with it. Okay. Um, and it needs to change from time to time, depending on, on the destination. And that means we need people that are okay with that. People who have a fundamental belief that uh, I can change, I can adapt, I can evolve, I can grow to continue to create value for my organization or and my customers. Mm -hmm. So um, what uh, the good news is that even though uh, the concept of uh, adapting culture is kind of new, uh, the concept of growth mindset culture is not. And, and you, you, I mean, you're the expert of, co of uh, company culture here, so correct me if I'm wrong, but my, my experience is that when we talk about culture, it's, uh, it's something that we, um, we tend to refer to as our core values, uh, something to hold on to, to stick with. It's not something that we can change and update overnight. Uh, so this is kind of a new concept. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, having a, a growth mindset culture is not. Carol Dweck, uh, as the mind behind uh, growth mindset, she presented her work in, and, and research and studies in her book back in 2006. The book is called Mindsets. Good title. Because it's what it, <laughs> it, covers, it covers it all. It covers yeah, it's right, it, yeah. straight to yes, the point, yes. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, my opinion is that it's, it has never been more relevant than it is today. Because having a, gr uh, having a growth mindset culture is based on belief that we're able to increase skills, that we are able to increase abilities and even intelligence. Um, through curiosity, through, uh, through learning and discipline. And if we look at the opposite, if you have a, a, what we call a fixed mindset culture, uh, a fixed mindset, uh, mindset culture is based on the belief that personal traits as fixed, as uh, native abilities cannot be changed. And creating a growth mindset culture is therefore a perfect add-on to any existing culture. You can have whatever culture you want to, but if you add on a growth mindset culture, you will make your organization ready for anything. And I think if, it, if one mindset you should have to 2021 is make your organization ready for anything because you never know. We learned that, right? Yeah. You, you never know. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, very concrete insights, uh, very clear also connecting the growth mindset to the adaptive culture to the goal, uh, strategic goals of an organization. Um, what I should say also, Payan, uh, sorry for interrupting you. No, no, no. What I should say is, I mean, luckily, because uh, at Dale Carnegie, we, we have been working for years trying to make um, companies more of a growth mindset company, more of a growth, a growth mindset culture. So even though this concept is new, for us it's not. It's the same. It is the only difference. It's um, it's more relevant now. Yeah. yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, it's amazing. And I'm just going to try to summarize where we are at at this point. So, so to create a right company culture, we have to ask ourselves if our current culture is adapted. Is, is adapted for our strategic goals and, and we need to implement a growth mindset to make our organization ready for a constant ready for anything mode and uh, that's basically where we're at uh, right now before uh, going on guys i just wanted to uh, send in some of the comments also we have uh, a worldwide audience very nice to see we have portugal we have sweden we have vietnam we have croatia welcome everyone wonderful to have you with us uh, we also got a question in regards to the netflix deck we will come out with a summary from this talk linking out to all the relevant stuff that we are talking about here uh, as well. Uh, please come in with your uh, further questions also. We will bring up bring them up on stage. Nicholas, I want to dive even up. Oh, Charlie, sorry, you were going. You were uh, saying. Sorry, no, I, I was just. I, I saw one question just from Kiara there. That 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 um, uh, was this question. In, in in your opinion, where does the change of culture start from? Top leaders, employees, or customer needs? Um, Nick, Nicholas, do you have any opinion on you as well? Do you have any uh, insights on that? Nicholas, you go. Uh, yeah, insights. I have opinions. Maybe um, it depends on on uh, what you mean here. But in in my opinion, if we want to drive change, it always starts from the top. Always. So if if we want change, we need to module it every every everything. We need to module everything. So if we want to see a more 
warming, recognizing culture, you will have to be, you, you will have to role model it. So it kind of starts from the top and down. And that's actually, it's a great question because actually it's one of the most common mistakes that we see when we come into an organization where, where they say, we want this or that culture. And we can say, why are you, why, why don't you show? Yeah. yeah. Don't tell, show. <laughs> No, and no, I also, I, I, yeah, sorry, Brian, you go. I also want to come back to what you said earlier. I mean, you referred to, to our, our work and our job and well, the cases we, we work with. Um, core values, we, we tend to refer to them as something to, to hold on to and stick, uh, stick, to, stick with no matter what. Uh, but that perception has changed, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, yeah. That perception has really changed. And to get the people on board, driven by leaders, obviously, uh, is absolute key. Uh, absolute key. Um, to have that uh, acceptance that uh, all, even the thing we thought would never change, maybe it must change in relation to our strategic goals and develop. And maybe some r not right people must go off the bus, as stated by Netflix also. Um, interesting discussions. Um, Charlie, did you have anything else to, to add to that or...? No, I think it's it's just really good. And so I think there are many perspectives here. I th I think and, and many things have to be in play together. Um, so so you you need leaders to drive change. Uh, but you also, but why should leaders drive change? What what change? Well, that change is affected uh, based on what your question was, the Kiara, on, on on primarily customers, isn't it? So when the market change, you, you have to be able to pick that up quickly and then have leaders that are willing to drive change, just the way you describe it, Nicholas. So I think they have a, a symbiosis there together. That was all I, I wanted to add on that one. And we'll come back to a couple of more questions a little bit later on. Nicholas, you work with leaders and organizations on a day-to-day -day -day basis, developing adaptive cultures through growth mindsets. Um, what are your key recommendations that our guests here today can, can apply right away? Yeah, uh, thank you for, for inviting me, first of all. And um, yeah, I've, do, I've, done my, I've done my homework and I've, I've collected some recommendation based on the topic here today. And, and, and the first one, is to uh, involve as many as possible as often as possible. I know this is hard. I know this takes a lot of time, uh, but I also know that one of the most important traits of a leader is to communicate. It's, it's actually the, the most important. The second important is to communicate, and the third is to communicate, and the fourth. <laughs> No, it's important. I'm trying to say, um, and, and companies who have a well, tradition. Sorry, of doing guess, things, I just wanted to know: what, what, was it important, or before? is it important to no, communicate? It's important. Or? Okay, ah, cool, to, cool, cool. To communicate yeah, is important. important. Okay, cool, yes. cool, okay. Yeah, the overall team has done it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So companies who have a tradition of doing things together are often more innovative. They're often more positive during uncertain and challenging times and situations. And um, I, I actually, um, I have a good example of this. Yeah, or thank you. Because I, because I was going to ask you for an example here. I mean, it's, it's such an easy thing uh, to no, say. Yeah. Involve yeah. everyone and uh, as often as possible, as much as possible. An example. I know you were going to keep me accountable. I know that. I know you. <laughs> now, actually, it's not a good example. It's a bad example. But, you know, we can all learn from that as well. Uh, I was watching TV last week, and I watched a, the Swedish version of um, a show called The Secrets of the SAS. And in this episode, the two uh, recruitants, uh, they got the mission to lead one squad each uh, through a challenging uh, task. The mission was to navigate and carry a heavy log through a rough terrain and return to the same point before the other team. What was so interesting was um, uh, to see how fundamentally different the two group leaders handle their mission. So one of them took command and, uh, over navigation and orientation, uh, as well as uh, how to carry the log. She was giving very clear uh, directions, instructions, and they were off long before the second group because they were still standing and discussing. The, the leader of the second group, though, uh, she started to ask questions like, uh, who feel confident in orientation and navigation? And one of the guys actually said, uh, yeah, well, I used to be on the Swedish national team of orientation. I, I can read the map. <laughs> and she was like, oh, perfect. So you're, you're, you will be ahead of orientation and navigation. OK, perfect. Uh, and, and, she started, and she also um uh, kept on asking questions as as the mission uh, succeeded uh, here's the interesting part um the instructor uh, the instructors uh, they had deliberately changed the course a bit and when they were lost the first group they just looked at their leader 
and pushed her to give clear directions and, and instructions. And she couldn't do that because she was lost and she took on all the respons responsibility. So they were, or they were extremely frustrated and she was uh, even openly criticized by two team members. The second group though, uh, who had been involved all of the time, immediately they started to collaborate and uh, they could easily just adjust the course and they arrived three hours before the first group. So it's an example of what can happen when we don't keep people in the loop. When trouble comes, they will just look at you, you know, uh, and, and ask, what are you going to do now instead of engaging with the problem? Yeah. Amazing example. example. Amazing example. That is why I always ask for your examples, because I know there are good examples. Yeah. So thank you. This thank is a you great collaboration. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, thank you, Nicholas. So uh, you. involve a, uh, as many as possible, as often as possible, yeah. as much as possible, to, to, as a key to building a growth mindset, as a key to adaptive cultures. Um, yeah. Your next recommendation and advice to send with our guest uh, today. Yeah, well, this, the second one is to find reoccurring opportunities to talk about learnings and, and, and uh, really learnings, not mistakes, because there is a fundamental difference in that. It will slowly, it will create a psychological safe uh, environment where we can grow from mistakes and we can be better in the future. If we don't dare to, to, um, to be fully transparent, we might uh, uh, end up in, in making the same mistakes, you know, over and over and over again, or worse, we would never learn about them and, uh, until it's too late and it has damaged the organization too much. Mm. <coughs> also, uh, again, recurring uh, opportunities to talk about learnings. Uh, yeah. If I were to implement that in my organization, uh, what should I do? Do you have an example? Uh, you, yeah, yes. Of do I have an example? <laughs> of course I have an example. Uh, we do it ourselves. Uh, actually, we have uh, once a week, we have a, a partner meeting in the Swedish Dale Carnegie organization. So every Monday we have an, a standing agenda and, and one of the standing objectives is learnings. Um, so we try to make the most out of mistakes and prevent each other from making the same mistakes. Uh, and it, it creates an, an, a relaxed uh, relationships uh, to failure, I, I, I think. But uh, most importantly, it creates an environment where people are willing to take risks and, and try new stuff. As a stand, as a standing point on your money. Yeah, yeah, put it as a standing point, a point or objective in in your um, uh, reoccurring meetings. Meetings. Thank you. And I can just imagine then, Nicholas, then just in, in connection to what we were mentioning earlier, then to to stay on top and and the question from Kiara, for example, there to to stay on top of what's happening on the market. That must be a highly valuable uh, moment for you guys to to recognize then that okay, this happened. Exactly. This, this this actually I, I noticed a change now. So I made that mistake, but it was a learning in 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 the way you say it. That must really um, help you guys stay on top of what's happening and 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 in that exactly. way stay adaptive and close to the market is is that correct that is that is absolutely correct you have a you have a hawk eye in that matter beautiful i know you have even more recommendations and hand hands-on tips yes, sir, uh, for us and for our guests today i'm full of tips as you know i'm an yeah, expert in the field that's yeah. why you're the top worldwide master trainer of course yeah, you are. yeah i want yeah. to take the opportunity to say that i i don't see myself as an expert in that way I, but but i do love this kind of environment where we uh, you, you know we we meet in this way and we can bring our own perspective into the game and hopefully it would get people watching here uh, thinking and 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 you know uh, form an, an own perspective and bring that into the picture as well uh, but of course uh, i want to give as much as possible so so the next uh, the third recommendation is to be a master of recognition and what i mean about that is that we need to be uh, able to take every opportunity to build self-confidence uh, build self-confidence in our people in our employees in our team members uh, what we pay attention to that will grow what you water will grow so if you want more of something you need to pay attention to it you need to recognize it and Boyan, you want an example maybe yeah uh, please <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so i have i have a great example it's one of uh, our participants from our leadership programs uh, she 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 went through the program one year ago and um, uh, she decided to become a master of recognition uh, she realized that working for her could be kind of tough and she wanted to build more self-confidence in her 
employees. She 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 is a, a tough person, you know, kind of direct and 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 sort so to speak. And she did so. Uh, and here is her way. She did that by having an open note in her iPhone where she wrote down small positive observation on a daily basis. And uh, when she collected three, she uh, her next move was to book a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And uh, with that person and and I'm, I'm just going to say that one-on-one -on -one meetings with her to that point was not an event you looked forward to <laughs> so it was kind of dramatic when she said you know can I can I just exchange uh, some words with you one-on-one -on -one? Uh, I just have a can I have a quick meeting and, and people went into that meeting you know with a, with their breath help and and uh, she told me uh, uh, just a couple of months ago um, you know this uh this is by far the uh, the most powerful routine and and habit i have ever implemented in order to build self confidence in my people yeah. i mean they were crying they were they were having like hallelujah moments because they didn't expect that from her she is she's a kind of demanding person and when we're demanding we need to also uh, bring something uh, extra to it, some recognition or accomplishment. Again, thank you. A great example. Uh, how long is your list of great tips that we have? I have 413 uh, examples. <laughs> yeah, we'll just and, add and some time. To... <laughs> what, what I should say, what I, I just wanted to mention one thing, because this tip, uh, when I heard it, I started to do it myself. Uh, and, and what I realized uh, was that, you know, we don't like simple solutions, don't we? Because when, when we hear simple solutions, we feel obligated to do them. Yeah, that's <laughs> so we like we like complex. It's it's almost like we like them to be complex and 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 advanced because then we can hide in the details. I don't I don't get it and stuff like that. But when we hear the simple solutions, we feel obligated to do them. But this is so simple, everyone can do it. Thank you. I I have a fourth as well, of course, uh, and it's it, it's it's connected to the first one, and is uh, when we recognize our people. It's not only to, to recognize the result, uh, but also to reward and recognize effort. And why, um, we think. And we're not automatically good or at something or great at something. Often it comes from repeated effort over time. Uh, and if we don't highlight and recognize the effort of becoming better, I mean, what's the point? What's the point of keep on trying? So greatness, it's, 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 it's a process. It's, it's not a state, it's not constant. <clears throat> that's really yeah the, you, you know you, what you, I, you yeah you was uh mind blowing that point you yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> I, I just figured he realized himself that i i'm asking for an example because i just want to yeah. set it in context so yeah yeah uh there there is a a, a study done uh, from stockholm business school that shows um uh, that leaders and 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 the employees are uh, they find themselves in two different uh, perspectives of time, you can say, where leaders uh, more in the perspective of from present to future and employees more living in, in the in the in the perspective, the past to the future. Yeah. So when they two meet, uh, they want different things. Leaders are more likely to talk about the next level, new goals, vision, challenges, etc. And employees want to talk about what they have done. Mm. And in the best of worlds, they also want to get some feedback and recognitions for that on the work that already has been done. Uh, so the study points out two major areas of improvement for leaders. I, this is in Sweden, so it will be for Swedish leaders. If we have uh, such people here uh, online today, which I know we have, uh, it's two things. It's uh, we don't ask enough questions mm. and we don't give enough feedback on work that has been done. So, and these two are connected as well, of course. Um, but if we want to, you know, build people, we should ask a lot of more questions regarding what they are doing right now, because that's enabled us to give feedback on stuff like their effort, their grit, um, their um, intentions, other things than, than, than just uh, results. And, and on that very point, uh, Nikos, I just want to weigh in a question we got from our audience here as well. Uh, what is a better practice? A leader who says, 
my door is always open. You can come to me anytime so I can share knowledge, feedback, you know, your past work, so on and so forth. Or a leader who actively seeks, seeks its employees and shares feedback, knowledge, recognition. Mm. Great question. Thank you, Anna. It is a great question because uh, you, you find me here, you know, thinking, thinking, thinking. Uh, and what I, what I, the only thing that I can come up with is that it's a relationship. You know, being a manager or leader is a relationship with you and your employees. And as in any relationship, if we do a comparison to, you know, a private one, if I, if I would say to my fiance back home, you know, my door is always open. You can come to me anytime and I can give you some appreciation. Or do we want people in our life coming up to us and say, you know, I saw you last week. And I just wanted to say to you that what you did, I really appreciated. You made me feel very special. You made me feel very um, recognized or whatever it is. I think, I think definitely that we need to be more active. We need to have a plan for it. We need to set goals on it. I mean, I worked with a leader two years ago who set a goal uh, for himself that he was going to give appreciations to 60 people in one month. It's two a day. So he just went into his office. Uh, now I don't have a whiteboard in here, but he he draw sixty lines on his whiteboard, and for every person he gave positive feedback, he just deleted a line, and when they were gone, he was gone. And his leadership index in in as it was, was a brilliant future, uh, um, um, what, what do you say, a math thing? Yeah, savvy, yeah. Savvy, yeah, went up from forty six percent to seventy six. That's it. That's wow. that's the only thing he did differently. So I, would, I, I definitely think we need to be more active. Great yeah. question, though. Great yeah. question and great answer. And the problem for me and Charlie is we have both our partners, uh, guests of this event today as well. So now we will gonna come home today and we will be very actively <laughs> being asked to to. No, no, no. You can you can always say you know my door is always open for you. Yeah, so exactly. If you, if you want to cuddle, <laughs> I'm I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> great advice, both both in in regards to a growth mindset and uh, relationships uh, overall. Thank you, Niklas. You, I know you, you want get a, you get them all here. Uh, indeed, we do. Uh, developing yourself and your team. I know you talk a lot about that as well. Yeah. I mean, research shows that of, if we talk about millennials for a while, I know a lot of many companies have a lot of millennials uh, on board. And if, if we focus on them for just a second, uh, research shows that uh, offering career training and, and, and development would keep 86% of millennials from leaving current positions. So this is a key uh, question. I mean, how do we how do we uh, uh, keep our staff developed and and uh, and uh, challenge through time? So there are many ways uh, you can keep people stimulated. You don't have to invest hundreds of thousands of tra uh, hundred hundreds of thousands in training with a, a leading uh, training company who will of course do everything uh, that it can in in its power to 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 develop your people. <laughs> I'm just uh, no uh, jokes aside. I mean, you can work with small things just to keep your team developed, and and uh, you can you can have two quick uh, tips. I mean, uh, for one, work with daily goals, especially now since many of us work from home. Uh, all of us know working from home that you know laundry has never been more attractive than <laughs> than now when we have dif uh, difficult tasks uh, in front of us. So working with daily goals, you know, to stay focused on what to do and what what not to do, that is one. Uh, and another quick uh, quick one to keep uh, your people developed is to to read, do it together, pick a book one a month, read it together. You know, book uh, walks outside where you can discuss or book an online meeting to 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 have your own book circle, uh, for example. As easy as that, and I just as easy uh, as love. That. And I just love the famous quote, quote also that I know you have referred to uh, earlier as well. Uh, what if we invest in, in the, the development of our people and they mm -hmm. leave? Uh, and the answer is, what if we uh, don't and they stay? Uh, <laughs> yeah. That is a much worse scenario. That hurts. Um, thank you, Nicholas. We have four more minutes of this talk, and we have one last uh, uh, recommendation also to, to be working with the growth mindset uh, on a daily basis. Would you share? Yeah, uh, and it, it is actually a phrase. It's to implement the power of yet. Uh, there's a tremendous power of the word yet because there's a big difference between I'm not good at that and I'm not good at that yet. Um, 
And, and uh, the person behind Growth Mindset, Carol Dweck, uh, she has a, a TED Talk uh, back in 2014, I think, uh, that I can highly recommend. Uh, but by doing so, by implementing the power of yet, we create an atmosphere where, where team members engage more with difficult tasks and problems instead of avoiding them. Um, I, I actually, we had a breakthrough yesterday, me and my youngest son, when I put him to bed every night, we do an IQ puzzle. And it's, it, he wants to do it. It's not me forcing him to. Uh, and and uh, I, gave him a, uh, I gave him a challenge yesterday and I said, you know, do you think you do you think you're going to make it? And he just looked at me and, and he has uh, had a little trouble. You know, I have identified that he finds it hard to to fail. So this was uh, very heartwarming for me because he said, I don't know, but I can try. Mm. And I think that if we can get people in our organizations to 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 reason the same way that I don't know if I'm going to make it, but I know I can try. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Then I would just state, I, I'm not a top worldwide master trainer yet. Yet, yeah. That's my takeaway from it. that. <laughs> uh, just, just summing this up, uh, 43 minutes in already, great discussions. Uh, we have a lot of questions also from our audience. We will uh, try to get back on that on, the, on the, those questions in the article, but please feel free to reach out to, to us as well after the event. Um, let's just take a, take a look at what we have gone through today. Uh, with creating the right company culture in mind, we have discussed the concept of adaptive cultures as developed by Kotter and Hesket. We have uh, given you guys, try to give you a, guys a clear question to ask yourselves and your organization. That is, do we have the right culture to reach our strategic goals? From that, we have gone th uh, through the link between adaptive culture and personal development described as growth mindset. Nicholas has taken us through uh, very concrete hands-on examples and, and they are as follow, uh, involve as many as possible as often as possible, as much as possible. Find recurring opportunities to talk about learnings, not mistakes. Be a master of recognition. Reward and recognize effort, not only results. Develop yourself and your team. And my favorite, implement the power of yet. Nicholas, thank you very much. Thank you. Charlie, thank you very much. Uh, to all our guests, thank you very much for joining us from all over the world. This is the Old Work Employer Branding Talk, and we will be back, and we will let you know as soon as we have set a new date. You are more than welcome to follow both Old Work and, of course, Dale Carnegie here on LinkedIn to stay up to date with them, employer branding trends, leadership trends, personal development insights, and upcoming events as well. The summary from today's talk will be shared right here in the LinkedIn event and in the Old Work News feed. We are looking very much forward to see you next time. Nicholas, thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank Charlie, thank you to thank all you our guys. guests. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. <gasps>